processes. Finally, um, things like permissions and directories are actually intrinsically useful things. Uh, they're not um, just hangovers. Um, if you build a new system based on objects, you might find yourself implementing some kind of hierarchical concept um, on your own. So sometimes, if it's what your application needs, having a file system that has those things baked in is very useful. So why do we use file systems for everything? Well, uh, they have some difficulties. They're much harder to scale than an object store, because while the objects in an object store are somewhat independent from one another, the uh, items in a file system, the inodes, the directory entries, and the directories um, are all connected to one another. And um, that makes it much harder to split things up and share them out um, between multiple servers. Some applications that expect a file system interface um, use it badly um, in a way that expects latencies associated with local file systems. Um, the classic example is people running a lot of ls-l calls from their applications, which will go through and stat every file in a directory, which worked fine on a local file system, but presents challenges for us when implementing a, a distributed file system um, in providing that kind of functionality without unacceptable latency overheads. And finally, the um, statefulness of file systems is challenging. So whereas with an object store, your client uh, will put or get um, in a file system, the client opens something and holds it open. So you have a whole load of state associated with your file system clients that needs to be managed. So the way that CephFS uh, addresses those challenges is firstly to fully implement the POSIX interface. Um, some distributed file systems settle for an NFS-like um, set of semantics. Um, that limits your ability to um, talk to all existing applications that have been developed and debugged on other file systems. So implementing the POSIX interface um, makes us very compatible with a whole lot of software. We get great scalability in our um, data storage because we store our files directly in RADOS and inherit all of its useful properties. Uh, we get scalability in our metadata by allowing users to have multiple metadata servers that act in a cluster. We add some functionality on top of uh, the basics that you would expect from a POSIX file system. So we have snapshots, um, which operate at a per directory level. And we also have recursive statistics, which allow users to um, identify statistics at a pair of directory level without having to recur down into the file system. And finally, this is uh, less of a feature of CephFS, but more of a, a feature of Ceph as a whole, that when you're using CephFS for your file storage, you get that unification with object and block. There is no uh, need to deploy different disks for your file system. So the way that all that's built um, is outlined in a fair bit of detail in the paper that I referenced at the bottom of this slide, which is Sages from way back in 2006. Um, some of the stuff in there has changed since, but a lot of it's still relevant. And that uh, year is kind of, uh, kind of amazing when you consider how rapid the development is on Ceph and CephFS now. Um, the project's actually over 10 years old, um, and the file system was one of the earliest parts to exist. So this diagram will probably be a little familiar for people who have been to pre previous talks about RADOS as well. Um, the little turquoise squares are OSDs, and the new uh, part of this is the little squares with a tree in, which are metadata servers or MDSs. So at the top of this diagram, you have your client host, which is running some CephFS client code. When we say client, we essentially mean amount. When you have slash MNT slash CephFS or something like that, that's a client. And the client is sending two types of information to the cluster, data and metadata, where metadata is things like opening a file or getting the attributes of a file, and data is the actual reads and writes within a file. As I mentioned, the data goes directly to RADOS, so it doesn't have to go through the metadata servers. There's no extra bottleneck there. And there are multiple metadata servers within the cluster. The way that we store the file data within RADOS is worth describing. So in a similar way to RBD and RGW, we support striping and chunking of the data. In CephFS, we already have a unique identifier for every file, and that's its inode number. 
So objects are named after the inode um, followed by a period and then the offset within the file where the offset is a, a count in the number in, in the size of chunk that's selected for the file, which is four megabytes by default. Users can change those um, settings on a per file or per directory basis, and they do that using virtual extended attributes, which are settable using uh, any existing system tools. So you don't need special Ceph specific tools on the client to do that. And in addition to specifying the striping of a file, the layout lets you say which Rados pool you want to store the data in. So you can have multiple Rados pools in use for CephFS. And when you do that, it lets you do interesting things like having um, a pool that uses SSDs um, that you might use for a smaller scratch directory within your file system. And then another pool that uses spinning disks that perhaps you might use for archival. Maybe you might have another pool again that uses um, cache tiering and erasure coding. Um, and you don't need separate clusters or separate file systems to do that. Um, and you don't need special tools for configuring that. You do it all through these magic virtual uh, extended attributes. Metadata is stored in Rados too. The MDSs don't um, store any local data on the disks and the hosts where they run. They put the metadata into directory fragment objects within um, Rados. And these are, these are things that take advantage of Rados's OMAP interface. So Rados lets you create an object and then use it as a key value store or an OMAP. In CephFS, uh, we want to support really large directories. So we don't want to create arbitrarily large um, OMAP objects. So we break directories up into fragments based on the hash of the um, directory entry names within a directory. And within that OMAP, the keys are the file names or the entry names, and the values are the directory entries, um, which also in CephFS includes the inode. So we embed the inodes directly with the dentry uh, so that when somebody retrieves a directory, they get all the data they need right there. Um, and that reduces latency uh, when somebody is traversing the file system. So um, the, uh, the takeaway from that is that there is locality in the way that we store um, files within a directory. So um, that we're taking advantage of what the user is essentially telling us that these files are in a directory, they're probably gonna get access to the same time and we reflect that in the way that we store it on disk. This is a simple example of what kind of objects you end up with after creating a directory and a file uh, within your CephFS file system. So we create a directory called MIDA. Uh, we write 12 megabytes of data to my file one within it. And on the left-hand side of this slide, uh, you see two objects in the metadata pool. These are directory fragment objects. The top one is for the root directory, the, the slash directory. Um, which has a magic inode number, which is already known to everybody working with the file system that is just one. So directory fragment 1.000 uh, contains a single entry for MIDA. These are, these are OMAP key values, which contains the inode for MIDA, which is 100001. Um, forgive me for not pronouncing the right number of zeros. Uh, that's just how we print them. And then for that MIDA, um, I know there is a directory fragment object, again, which contains an OMAP key for my file one, which uh, contains an inode that says 10002. Uh, and in the data pool, you've got uh, the objects for the file. There are three because the default chunk size is four megabytes and we wrote 12 megabytes. And they just contain the data. Uh, the first object in a file has this extra extended attribute called parent that contains the full path to the file at the time it was created. And uh, the use for that will become clear very shortly. So this structure on disk is optimized for the lookup by path case, where somebody says, I want to open slash my do one slash my file. Um, and so we can go and read the root directory fragment, find my do, read the MIDA directory fragment, find my file, and then go and see the objects on disk for that. That's fairly straightforward. We additionally have to support lookup by inode. So for anybody implementing a um, file system that supports full POSIX semantics, you have to have this essentially double index for inodes. 
Sometimes you have to look them up by path, and sometimes you have to look them up by inode number. So in order to look up by inode number, we um, have this extra attribute on the first data object of files. We call it a backtrace. And we can get to that directly by inode number because we name our data objects after the inode number. And that allows us to handle support for hard links and for NFS file handles. So the NFS protocol is, um, works in such a way that clients are allowed to maintain references to files after they have forgotten the name of the file and the path to the file. So they're just doing it by inode. So in order to have proper NFS support, we have to have this lookup. The downside to this is we are slightly fudging our model in that we're storing this piece of metadata within the data pool. We're doing, in some cases, some extra IOs to um, set these backtraces. But there is also a kind of a nice bonus from doing this, which is that these backtraces allow us to do interesting things during disaster recovery. So for example, if you lose your metadata pool and you want to try and rebuild your data as best you can, you do have some record in the data pool of what the path um, was originally for the files. And that's what this looks like when you do a lookup by inode. So you initially go read the backtrace from the data object, and then the rest of the lookup is just the same by path process going through the directory fragments, um, except instead of having been given the path by the client, we got the path by looking up the uh, backtrace. So that's how the uh, data and metadata is stored within Rados. All of that work of storing that metadata is done by the metadata servers. These are daemons, much like the mons or the OSDs, um, written in C++. And initially, when you start up an MDS daemon on a host, it uh, does nothing at all. It communicates with the mon, and it goes into a standby mode. And it doesn't do anything until the mon assigns it a rank. And so a rank is like a logical or virtual MDS, um, in that if you want to have, say, three active MDSs at any given moment on a system, you would have three ranks, but you might have any number of MDS daemons physically beyond that. It's just only three of them will be holding a rank at any moment. And the, the real meaning of a rank is that it is um, the authority for some set of data on disk. So the um, directory fragment for a particular directory isn't getting written by all the different MDSs at once. Um, only one MDS at any given moment is going to take responsibility for that piece of metadata. The MDS ranks also have some of their own data of the per rank data, such as a journal and things like an allocation table for um, assigning new inodes. There's one of those per rank as well. And by storing those in Rados, we can fail over MDS ranks really quickly. Um, because there is just no data at all left behind on the MDS servers themselves. You start a new one, it gets assigned the rank, and it picks up where the old one left off by reading all that metadata from Rados. The actual assignment of which piece of metadata goes to which rank is done dynamically, and it's done um, in terms of subtrees. So in this diagram, the colors represent different MDS ranks. And the gray MDS0 part um, starts at the root, and that's where all the metadata would have been initially. And then over time, as the system's used, pot directories get uh, reassigned um, to different MDSs. But then if there is a particularly hot directory within a parent directory that was also quite hot, um, this can be recursive as well. So you can see in this diagram that um, there are colors within colors. Um, that might seem like a lot to keep track of, um, but in reality, all the MDSs actually need to know about this situation is not where each individual inode is, but just where the boundaries are. So, and we, that's the, um, the subtree map. I'm just going to pause for a second and see if there are any questions in chat. Nope. OK. I should have said at the start, feel free to just drop any questions that pop into your head into the chat as we go. Don't have to save them up till the end. So <clears throat> when the MDS is making updates to this metadata, if you had a whole bunch of files, um, oh, sorry, a whole bunch of clients making updates to files, um, you would find that for things like incrementing the size of a file to reflect data appended to it, 
that would generate a lot of little pieces of I.O. to update the metadata objects on disk. So we don't do that. Metadata ops are written to a journal. Um, there's a journal for each MDS rank. And when we uh, have received some updated metadata, we've written it to the journal, we have that in an in-memory cache, uh, a cache of inodes and entries and directories. Um, it will remain in that in-memory cache until it falls off the end of the journal. And we actually use pretty big journals. Um, the default size of the journal is in the hundreds of megabytes, and you can make it a lot bigger than that if you want. Um, and that's because it's nice uh, not to have to worry about hurrying to um, evict things, um, not evict, sorry, expire things from the journal. Um, but it also lets us um, do failover even more efficiently because after we replay the journal, we've got a great big journal with um, a large collection of recent metadata operations in it. Our cache will be warmed up with everything that was recently operated upon um, by clients. The cache can get pretty big within the MDS. Um, we don't um, remove anything from the cache unless we have to. So um, typically, you want to size this for the amount of RAM in your metadata server, and you want to provision servers that have plenty of RAM for use as MDSs. The MDS cache size parameter lets you control that. That's a limit by the number of inodes. Um, and controlling cache size has um, actually been kind of a um, tricky area recently, and that's because the clients have to be involved in the process too. If a client has a file open or a file in its cache, the uh, MDSs can't necessarily remove it from their cache. They have to pin it as long as a client is using it. And so in order for the MDSs to shrink their cache, they have to ask the clients to shrink the client caches. Um, and as you can imagine, that is a, it's a distributed systems problem, therefore it's hard. Um, and if you follow the mailing list, you will have seen um, various people asking about some of the warnings that we've added recently for um, clients failing to, uh, failing to respond to capability releases and that kind of thing. And those messages are about this. They, they are about the um, client's participation in the process of controlling the cache size. In addition to a standby mode where the MDS just sits there doing nothing and waiting for a job, we also have a mode called standby replay. Um, that's where an MDS can follow along the log of an active MDS um, so that when a failure occurs and the standby has to take over, it has already read in all of the metadata that it needs. Um, the downside to doing this, and the reason that it's not the default, is that it means you have to specifically allocate a standby for each of your um, active MDSs, whereas by default, a standby MDS can take on any role. If you're in standby replay, you can really only take over from the guy you were replaying. So I mentioned that the client maintains a cache. Um, the client MDS protocol is kind of interesting. Um, it's implemented twice, once in our user space client, which, is, um, which has a fuse interface, and once in our um, kernel client, which is part of the upstream Linux kernel. The uh, clients start up and they learn the addresses of the MDSs from the mons. So when you manage that file system, you don't type in the address of an MDS because MDSs are completely dynamic. You type in the address of a mon. And the client will go ahead and open a session with each of the MDSs that it finds it needs to talk to. And those MDSs, uh, in response to requests from the client to, for example, open a file, will issue capabilities. And these are quite fine-grained things. They'll tell you things like, you are allowed to buffer um, reads and writes to this object. You are allowed to write to it. You're allowed to read from it. You're allowed to update the metadata for it. You're allowed to update extended attributes for it, that kind of thing. And that means that when you've got multiple clients which are taking an interest in the same file, although we have to do this locking to maintain POSIX semantics, um, we don't, um, it's not an all or nothing thing. Um, the fact that, for example, one client is writing to a file won't necessarily stop other clients from being able to see the metadata for the file um, as it gets updated. The um, state associated with these capabilities in the MDS isn't um, persisted, um, because if we were to persist it, that would generate a huge amount of I.O. And the way that we um, deal with that is that there is a routine that the clients in the MDS MDSs have to go through after a failure. So when an MDS comes back online or another daemon takes over that rank, 
um, the MDS, the clients have to send a reconnect message to the MDS, which tells it, here are the things I have in cache, here are the locks I hold, or the capabilities that I hold. And here are any metadata operations I was doing that weren't quite finished yet. Um, that uh, might sound like kind of a low-level implementation detail, but this stuff's worth knowing um, even as an administrator because you will see the MDS going through these stages um, as uh, it starts up after a failure or when you first start. Um, it'll go through replay of its own journal. It'll go through a reconnect phase where it's waiting for the clients to come back, and it'll then go through a client replay phase where the um, incomplete client operations are getting um, replay. So if you see a system um, stuck or seemingly stuck in any of those states, they can take some time, um, then it's useful to know what that means and what's actually going on within the system. That's a common failure mode in distributed file systems, not just ZFS, um, that this, this dance that you have to go through after a failure, um, if the clients are unresponsive or one of them's died, um, we do cope with that, but it's not necessarily immediately obvious what's going on. So I've talked about things failing and things failing over and clients recovering from that. Um, the way we actually detect the failures is that all of the MDSs send um, beacons to the monitors. And there's code on the monitors which will um, decide when an MDS has been too late, too laggy. And if there is a standby available, um, we will then blacklist the MDS at the RADOS level, so prevent it from doing any more writes in case it is still alive. Um, in some systems, that would be called fencing when we do that. And um, let another MDS start up and take on that role. So that all happens completely autonomously. There's no admin intervention required. <clears throat> and clients do a similar thing, except instead of pinging the mons, because there can be a very large number of clients, we don't want to overload the mons with that, the clients ping the MDSs. And then the MDSs individually decide um, if a client has been um, too late. Uh, and if it has, we'll drop any um, resources it was holding so that other clients can get access to them. Just dropping out to check the chat again. Chat again. Uh, okay, there's a question. Does the dynamic subtree partitioning um, in place already, as it was said to be unstable? So um, yes, it's in place. Um, and if you want to know how stable it is, uh, you have to test it. So um, we're not... Um, actively testing that intensively at the moment. Um, our QA focus at the moment is on single MDS systems um, to get that as robust as we can. Um, but I'll come on to that a little bit later in the presentation. So that's what CephFS is and how it works. Now, how do you use it? So first, how do you get it? Well, it's packaged and released um, as part of Ceph. Um, on some systems, it might be in a separate package called Ceph MDS that you need in your MDS daemons, um, but it's within the whole release cycle of Ceph. You can use Ceph deploy to create MDS daemons. Um, there's a manual process you can do too, which is documented, and the various orchestration frameworks that have modules for Ceph. Um, uh, many of them, I imagine, know how to do MDSs too. Your main point of contact for dealing with your file systems and MDSs is the mons, just like with the rest of Rados. So the same Ceph command line tool that you're familiar with gives you access to the command and control parts of um, CephFS as well. Some low level things are exposed in the form of admin sockets. MONs, MDSs, and OSDs all have these things called an admin socket, which allows you to log into the node and issue certain commands locally to them. And there are quite a few um, admin socket commands in the MDSs. Um, some of which we will eventually expose up via the mons as well. We tend to add new functionality in the form of an admin socket command first, and then um, expose it elsewhere later. So what that looks like in a terminal is actually pretty brief. Uh, you've got one command on, with Ceph deploy to deploy an MDS. Uh, you need to create a data pool and a metadata pool for your file system, and then use the fs new command to configure the file system. Once you've done that, the MDS that you just deployed um, will be informed by the mon that the file system is now available. It'll come up and take rank zero and start operating as an active MDS. And at that point, you can go ahead and mount it. So the example at the bottom is how you mount CephFS using the kernel client. And where I have the Xs, that's where you would put the IP address of one of your mons. 
at the point that you've mounted it, that slash MNT slash Ceph location will just look like any other file system on your system. Here's another practical example. Um, I mentioned we have recursive statistics that give you uh, real numbers for what happens on a directory. Um, sorry if this is a little bit difficult to read because of the line wrapping. So on the top half of this is what we're all familiar with, with a local file system like ext4. You go and do an ls on a directory, and ext4 claims the directory is 4 kilobytes. Um, well, it's, it's a little bit strange, but we're all very familiar with, uh, with that. If uh, you're familiar with Linux, you will have seen that. Uh, whereas with CephFS, uh, if I go and look at one of my directories in a CephFS file system, it's telling me 16 megabytes in this example. And that would be the size of the files within the directory or within any children of the directory. Snapshots are also exposed um, directly within the file system. There's no special tools needed to create and manage snapshots. Every directory in a CephFS file system has a magic .snap directory. This doesn't correspond to a real piece of on-disk metadata. This is something virtual that the MDSs see you accessing the .snap directory and translate that into snapshot operations. So in this example, um, I'll just step through it. I create a file called history in my backups directory, go into the .snap folder and use the make directory command to create a snapshot called snap1. Uh, that might be a little bit counterintuitive that we're, we're sort of dual purposing make directory here. Um, file systems don't give you a way of adding new commands. So uh, instead of a make snapshot command, you have a make directory command. At the point that we've created that snapshot, we can go back up into the backups directory, delete the history file, do an ls, see that it's really gone. But then if we do an ls in .snap slash snap1, we'll see that it's still there. And so once you've created a snapshot, they show up as if they were directories within the .snap folder. And similarly, if you want to get rid of a snapshot, you can get rid of it with um, the remove directory command. The statistics that you can get out of any Ceph service uh, are particularly useful for MDSs. Um, so you can run this command on any type of service, not just MDSs, but um, to get insight into what's going on in your system. If you want to know why is my client stuck, why is my file system not pushing RADOS as hard as I'm expecting it to, it's very useful to look at these stats, um, especially the rates of client requests. Uh, the sixth column from the left-hand side, the HCR or handle client request column, is kind of interesting, especially when you compare it to the next column along, which is object to rights, which is an internal name for um, our RADOS rights from the MDS. So you can see you can actually see the journaling going on here. We're getting a fairly steady stream of client requests coming in, but we're going through several seconds of not doing very much in terms of RADOS rights, and then a little flurry of updates. And that corresponds to um, expiry of um, log segments within the, the MDS log. If you want to know what the rest of these stats are, um, you can use the um, perf dump schema command. Um, which is available on any Ceph daemon, and they have little strings that tell you what they are. You can also ask in IRC and that kind of thing. Um, they're sort of internal things, but they are pretty useful as well. So if you have clients that don't speak CephFS, you want to expose your CephFS file system to other systems, it's typical that you'll want to put um, an NFS gateway um, or a Samba gateway or something like that in front of it. And so there is a bunch of support for that. There's a module for the user space NFS Ganesha server for talking directly to CephFS. You can mount a CephFS file system using the kernel client and then re-export it using kernel NFS. And you can put a Samba daemon on top of CephFS as well. Uh, there are varying degrees of testing that has been done so far in this. Um, we recently had some very useful feedback about um, how the NFS server especially was handling or not handling cache pressure properly. So um, as with any of these upstream components, please do try these things out. But if you find bugs, then um, be ready for that and be ready to report them to us. OK, there's a question here. Does the MDS know Crush? So Crush is the algorithm that's used within um, RADOS for deciding how to locate um, data across a 
population of disks. Um, in order to place something um, within that population of, well, so Crush tells you where to put placement groups. And then to decide what placement group an object goes into, you take the hash of the object name. So in Rados, we scatter the objects across all of those um, placement groups, and the placement groups get placed on OSDs using Crush. The MDS doesn't use Crush. Um, and that's because the MDS isn't necessarily aiming for a uniform distribution of data. What the MDS is aiming to do is continuously monitor what the hotspots are in the metadata hierarchy, and then decide based on that dynamically where to move things around. So in the metadata servers, um, when we're assigning metadata from one MDS rank to another, we're doing that explicitly. Um, and the placement in, in terms of which MDS a piece of metadata belongs to is determined dynamically. Whereas within Rados, the place that an object lives is implicit in its ID and the place that a placement group lives is implicit in the, um, the, the crush calculation. So um, I hope that answers that. Um, and there's a question about permission and access control, um, which I will come to a little bit later in the presentation. So I want to talk about um, the most recent developments in CephFS, um, what's happened over the last uh, year or so. Our focus at the moment is very much um, getting to the point where more people will be comfortable using CephFS in production. So at the moment, CephFS is it's functional, it works, you can install it and put your data on it and go read it back and it'll still be there. Um, what's missing is our ability to really recover when things go wrong and our ability to really make firm statements about how well a given release of CephFS is functioning based on um, testing that. So we need more testing, we need more QA, um, and we need new tools to be able to recover a file system when something goes wrong. One of the downsides to POSIX file systems generally is because of the tightly coupled nature of all the inodes and the directories and the entries, um, if you poke a hole anywhere in that and just knock out one piece of metadata, you're going to potentially remove access to all the metadata that sat beneath that in the tree. And that makes it more fragile inherently um, than an object store, for example, would be. So that's why with file systems, you have things like FSCK programs. You have things like um, online scrub capabilities. And um, both of those things are in development for CephFS right now. And more broadly, our focus at the moment is on um, getting a modest um, MDS configuration without too much, um, without multiple MDSs necessarily, without using snapshots, um, and get that running as robustly as we possibly can um, before moving on to um, getting those um, nicer features more um, thoroughly tested. Um, so, you know, I, I need to be clear that those features are in there and they work, um, but if you want to know exactly how well they work, we haven't yet got the level of QA to make a statement on that. Um, I'd like to throw in some statistics um, just so that people can see quantitatively um, how much has been going on. So these are a little out of date because hammer has been out for a while now. Um, but during the Firefly Hammer period, you can see many hundreds of commits, many thousands of lines of code, um, many thousands of lines of code added to the tool CephFS directory and to CephQA suite as well um, for testing specifically um, of the file system, and a pretty steady turnover of bug tickets. So as bugs come up in the file system, either reported by users or found by our automated tests, we're continuously fixing them. We're, fix we're also backporting um, some file system fixes. So although um, there isn't quite the level of um, support for long-term releases um, of the file system yet, because um, it's not in use in production as widely as um, the other components of Ceph, um, we are still making an effort to certainly not break things, not to break backwards compatibility. We don't do that. 
um, but also to make sure that when there are bugs which are affecting the um, people who are early adopters of CephFS that they get taken care of. So I'm just going to really quickly run through um, the various um, sort of grab bag of things that have been added recently. So we have new health checks on the MDS. Um, when things go wrong, it can be pretty difficult to know why your ls command is just blocking. Um, that's often a symptom in a distributed file system, not just in CephFS, um, or very many things that can go wrong. So we need a way of reporting um, exactly what's gone wrong, um, especially if clients are misbehaving. Um, because if somebody has older versions of clients, and that happens a lot if somebody's got an older kernel, um, we need to report that so they don't think their MDS is broken, so they don't think their other clients are broken, and they can identify which client uh, or which version of the client is causing the problem. There's a little um, complexity in there in that there are potentially quite a large number of clients in a SEF system, so we don't want to give you a thousand health alerts um, when something goes wrong across the system. So there is um, aggregation of those alerts too. So if you have a bunch of clients, you'll you'll see those health checks shrink down into a five clients have such and such an issue. Similarly, uh, if something seems to, seems to be stuck or not progressing, you can now use the op tracker component to um, get a very detailed internal view um, of what's going on within the MDS. This is a little bit less user friendly because it is very internal information. Um, but it allows you, if you've got a system that's stuck and you need to send some information to developers um, or to whoever is supporting your system, you can give them that level of information. This is uh, an existing class that existed in the OSD before, and it's um, now exposed in the same way in the MDS. So a big focus at the moment is on file system check and repair. So um, if we've lost data objects, we would like to know what files does that affect, what files are damaged, if we've lost metadata objects, we'd like to know how that affects our file system hierarchy and what subtrees or parts of subtrees are now unavailable. Um, and we need to do that continuously and online because if you have a petascale file system, taking it offline to do a check is prohibitively expensive. You would have to be offline for so long to scan such a large amount of data that it's really mandatory to do all this stuff online. And that means scrubbing. So you have an online scrub, which, or well, shortly we will have an online scrub um, that will check that the recursive stats are consistent, that if something says, if a directory says it has 16 megabytes of data in files within it, that those files really exist and we do have that total size. Does the metadata um, that we have in memory in our cache really match what's on disk? And does our metadata for files match reality? So if we've got metadata that says a file should be 200 megabytes, um, is it really 200 megabytes? And this is partly about detecting damage um, from uh, loss, of, loss of objects on disk. Um, although RADOS is, is very resilient, if you do have, for example, a three disk failure and you lose some subset of your placement groups, um, we want to make it so that that won't kill your entire file system. You'll only lose the data you've really lost rather than having your whole file system go down. But as well as that data loss case, it's also about making the system um, resilient to bugs because bugs happen. And we need to make sure that um, when someone hits an issue, we can take them through a process of recovering and fixing their system rather than saying um, that the system is now entirely inaccessible because one aspect of it experienced a bug. So some parts of this recovery and repair capability are starting to come online um, in the master branch, at least. Um, there's a brand new CephFS data scan tool, um, which enables you to scan through the data pool and essentially scrape out the files by exhaustingly, uh, exhaustively examining the objects within the pool. Um, but a little bit more selectively, we can identify which files in the data pool appear not to be referenced by the metadata, so things which are orphans and take action, such as um, removing them or recovering them, so creating metadata that would reference them um, so you can get back to your file, um, or scraping the file out to a local file system. So that if you've got something that's badly damaged and you just need to get to those files somehow, um, we can now scrape them right out of the data pool onto desk. Um, there is a performance challenge here, a scalability challenge, in that um, in the same way that you can't have an offline um, FSCK um, 
for continuous use because um, it would be prohibitive to take the system offline for too long. When you're using this tool, um, which is optionally an offline or online tool, depending on how you're using it, um, you don't want to just be running one instance of this and having it step through your tens or hundreds of millions of radar objects. So there will be a new capability at the RADOS level to um, have many workers share out the namespace in a um, in a RADOS pool um, and work on it in parallel. So this tool will take advantage of that. And what it will look like is you'll have um, tens or well, however many you want instances of this program running in parallel to scrape the data out of your system in the case of a disaster. Um, there is a, a sort of sibling tool that has um, existed for a little bit longer. This has been in the last couple of releases called CephFS Journal Tool. Um, and what this gives you is the ability to, to recover from damaged journals. So we've seen at various points um, bugs or incidents that have um, led to people having damaged journals. Um, and historically, um, that would break your system pretty badly. It would um, not necessarily be completely unrecoverable, but it was pretty hard to recover from it because without these journals, um, the MDSs couldn't even start up. So this is an offline tool, which if your MDSs won't start up because something's gone wrong with your journals, it lets you interrogate what's there, identify specifically which parts of the journal appear to have become unreadable or unusable, and then take action to fix that, such as um, by blanking out parts of the journal that um, you no longer want to try and touch because you know they're broken, um, or by um, trying to scrape out as much metadata as we can from the journal before purging it from the desk. Um, all of these disaster recovery tools operate on a best effort basis. Um, if you've lost data, then we can't, um, we can't recreate that. If it's gone, it's gone. Um, the emphasis here is on limiting the damage and making sure that um, if one file was damaged, then only that one file should be inaccessible, not your whole file system. Aside from uh, repair and recovery, more general resilience features. Um, so this, this made it into Hammer, um, if I recall. The um, way we handle full space used to be a little bit difficult in the file system. So by default, Rados clients will always stall if, they, um, if the cluster goes full. They'll just wait for the cluster to not be full anymore. Uh, the problem with that in CephFS is that um, in order to delete things, you have to be able to write to your metadata journal. Um, and we also had a problem that um, you couldn't delete things if a client was still holding onto it. And a client would still be holding onto it um, if it had dirty data, but it couldn't flush because the cluster was full and therefore it's like those reports. So that mechanism has been reworked. And as of Hammer, you will get um, nice friendly you know, space errors rather than having things block when the system goes full. There is uh, a number of new features which enable you to have some visibility of your clients on your cluster. Um, so there is a, a session ls admin socket command that allows you to list what clients are created. We've also added um, client metadata, which is transmitted from the clients to the MDSs. And it tells you things like the kernel version, the um, host name, and the path that something's mounted at, which means that rather than um, saying client 2378 had an issue, we can say client my host name one had an issue. Um, it's a simple thing, but it makes a real difference um, if someone's trying to work out which client is clobbering their system. Uh, client eviction, um, so killing the session of a client which is known to be dead or believed to be dead or misbehaving, um, used to operate in a, in a slightly best effort way, and that has been tightened up now. So it's now possible to properly blacklist um, a client and fence a client. So even if you have a misbehaving client, you can ensure that um, you can safely remove it from the system. And that's an example of what it looks like when you run session LS, you get um, a bunch of useful information about your clients. In the future, it would be useful to extend this um, to environment specific um, pieces of information like what HPC job um, is a client part of, what VM does a client belong to, what container does it belong to, that kind of thing. Uh, there have been various client improvements, especially to cache trimming. Um, that didn't work too well a year ago, and it works a lot better now. Um, in the Fuse client, there is new flock support, flock support. Um, 
So if your application relies on that, you can now use it with the Fuse client. And there is a new uh, quota feature in the Fuse client. Um, this is implemented client side. So at the moment, it's specific to the Fuse client. It's not available in the kernel client. And there are some caveats around the quota support. Um, it's not completely strict. The clients are allowed to overshoot slightly. And if you have malicious client code, they would be able to simply ignore the quota. But for many use cases, um, it's, uh, it's a useful feature. So in addition to adding all of those useful capabilities, um, there's a lot, a lot of work gone into testing and QA as well. And that's really ultimately the answer to, is a given release of CephFS ready, um, is going to be, does it pass the tests? Um, so Ceph has um, a topology test framework, which uh, a lot of people in this call will be familiar with, and that's used across Ceph. Um, so a bunch of new functional tests written in Python have been added to that recently um, for CephFS. And these are white box tests that exercise um, specific features and go through very careful processes to create undesirable um, states for the system and check how it responds to them, as opposed to the kind of testing that we've done historically, which was more of a long running probabilistic thrashing type thing we did on the system. So our tests are becoming um, more extensive. And in addition to the, the thrashing tests, which remain extremely valuable, we have um, more tightly defined functional tests. But we also dog food CephFS for some of the um, storage used within our lab environment. Um, and I always leave that bold line at the bottom that third party testing is super valuable. You will do things that we have not thought of or that we have not had time to do. Um, so please try CephFS if you're interested in using it eventually, but maybe you're waiting for it to become a bit more stable. You can help us get it more stable by testing it right now. Uh, there's some ongoing work to improve um, the access control features around CephFS. So historically, you could kind of do a trick where you would set layouts on particular folders that use particular pools and then make sure that certain clients could only access certain pools at the Rados level, but it didn't prevent clients from doing naughty metadata operations. So it was, it was kind of a little bit fuzzy. Um, and there's new features going in here now to have robustly enforced um, client access controls using the, um, the auth caps mechanism that exists throughout Ceph. Um, and that's going to let us do things like limiting access um, by a path prefix to a particular client. So say this client, even if it misbehaves, even if it's got malicious code on it, can only access um, files beneath slash foo slash bar. Um, and doing things like um, root squash, um, which will be familiar to anyone using um, NFS. And you sort of combine a few of those access control semantics, and you will have something that is a very good fit for doing things like container volumes in a secure way. So from here going forward, um, we need to get the FSC can repair tools done, um, get them to a stage where we're, we're confident that if something goes wrong in the field, um, we will be able to fix it. Um, because that those tools are what will enable vendors such as Red Hat and others to um, look to provide um, proper support for CephFS in the future, um, rather than the current situation where most people using CephFS are self-supporting. And then from there, we can move on and touch on all these other areas like um, hardening the multi-MDS support and the rebalancing and all that good stuff, getting the snapshots um, working even better than they are now. Um, and getting the testing around that that gives us the confidence that they're working. Um, and integration with cloud and container environments. So for example, the Manila project with an OpenStack is of a lot of interest to us um, because that provides an avenue by which people can uh, use CephFS with their OpenStack clouds. And just really quickly at the end, um, if you are trying out Ceph, uh, CephFS right now as an early adopter, um, these are links you definitely should know if you don't already. So the mailing list, the IRC channel, um, the issue tracker, um, documentation, including um, troubleshooting documentation. And um, <clears throat> when you encounter an issue, does the most recent release fix it? Because stuff is getting fixed all the time. And that includes in the kernel, if you're using the kernel client. Uh, if you're reporting an issue, tell us as much about your configuration as you can, especially what versions you're using, whether you're using the kernel client or the Fuse client. 
what are you doing with the file system? What kind of workload are you doing? Um, and um, ideally, if you can reproduce an issue um, with debug logging enabled, that makes us really happy. And that makes for a really good trouble ticket if you can do that. So with that, um, I will wrap up and go see if there are any more questions in the chat. Um, if anyone's typing into IRC, um, please come type your question into the BlueJeans chat because um, with the screen sharing, I don't have my IC client right here. So here's a question. Uh, is there any limit in number of pools in a SAF cluster? Um, I don't know if the, off the top of my head if there's a hard limit, um, but there's a practical limit because um, when you um, create a pool, you're creating PGs and PGs create resources or consume resources on OSDs. Um, so you don't want to create an indefinitely large number of pools. The, the, this is a Rails thing, by the way, not a CFFS thing. Um, the solution to that is something called uh, Rados namespaces. Um, and what that allows you to do is create um, subdivisions or well, namespaces uh, within a pool without creating any more PGs and without creating any more, uh, without consuming any more physical resources. So one of the um, things we would like to do in the near future is allow CephFS layouts to specify not just a pool, but a pool and a namespace so that people can divide things up using namespaces rather than pools and avoid spuriously consuming any resources. Um, but as, you, as you've written there, a, a, a thousand to 10,000 pools, um, you would not want to create a Ceph cluster with, with that many pools. Um, a question from Eric, um, who I should also thank for the um, NFS Ganesha bug report. That's very useful. Um, with kernel 4.1 and 902, I'm seeing a difference in file locking between kernel and fuse using the Samba CTP ping pong test. Um, should I report it as a bug? Um, yes, please. Um, it may also be affected by what version of fuse itself you're using, but I imagine if you're using kernel 4.1, you're probably using a recent version of fuse. So there is a possibility that could be our bug, but I'm not aware of a bug in that area. So. We'll see what's going on. Question, am I going to post slides? Um, this whole talk is, is videotaped. It's going to be on YouTube. Um, ben asks, how does MDS fencing work? How do you guarantee that fenced off MDS does not subsequently modify metadata? So <clears throat> fencing or blacklisting um, is something that's implemented at the Rados layer. So it's one of the very, very, very useful primitives that um, Rados gives us. Um, when you fence, um, a Rados client, in this case, an MDS. Um, what we do is um, write an entry to the OSD map. Um, the OSD map is um, shared out across all of the OSDs and also across all of the clients. And if a client tries to do a write um, with a lower versioned OSD map, um, they send the version with each operation they do, um, then that write will be rejected by the OSD. And the OSD will say, um, nope, there is a more recent OSD map. Here it is. Um, and so at that point, you can guarantee that um, the clients won't be allowed to work with an older version of the OSD map. So they will have seen the blacklist. And importantly, more importantly, the OSDs will have seen the blacklist. Um, on top of that RADOS mechanism, um, within CephFS, we also distribute um, within our, we have a similar structure called the MDS map, and that has an OSD map version in it that reflects the version at which we last blacklisted something. So what happens is we blacklist MDS A, and we create a new version of the OSD map, let's say version 99, um, that includes that blacklist entry. We write 99, to our MDS map, and then we write to our MDS map in the same transaction that um, MDS A has failed. So anybody seeing the MDS map that says MDS A has failed will also see that you need OSD map 99 before taking any actions which assume that MDS A has failed. Um, so when MDS B gets handed the rank that MDS A used to have, um, it will wait for OSD map rank 99 um, before doing any 
um, I/O operations, and as a result, that whole process, um, which I hope I explained somewhat cogently, um, guarantees that um, it's not possible for um, any rights from MDSA to land on any OSDs um, after the point that MDS e, MDSB has taken over the rank. Um, there's a question, how does CephFS work with a cache tier uh, of SSD pools backed by regicoded pools? Any specific implications? Um, so CephFS um, can use a, a cache tier um, because Rados exposes cache tiers um, pretty transparently when you're using an overlay mode. Um, you essentially just create a cache tier on top of a pool, set it as the overlay for that pool, and then um, point CephFS at the underlying pool, and it will pick up the overlay, um, just the same as any other Rados client would. Um, you, the caveat is you can't use a regicoded pools directly. Um, so you, you would have to use um, a cache pool if you want to use a regicoded pools. Um, you should also be aware that that's not something we've tested a lot. Um, and you might find, have, find you have really quite interesting performance characteristics um, if you do something like that. Um, so for example, if your, um, if your data pool was on a cache tier and you had a lot of hard links, um, we were having to go and um, experience cache misses a whole bunch in order to resolve hard links and that kind of thing, um, then uh, your, your mileage may vary. But um, yes, I mean, it does work because Rados does such a good job of abstracting all that stuff away for us, um, but it's not particularly heavily tested. Okay, last question. Update on the new store and its effects on CephFS. Um, the only knock-on effect on CephFS with new store is that um, it's coupled to some of the, the sharded object listing feature that we need for making CephFS data scan scalable. So that's the only coupling there is there. Other than that, Rados is a, is a um, completely it's a very good abstraction, and it means that folks working with CephFS, for the most part, really don't have to worry too much about changes um, further down in the stack. Um, and if you want an actual update on NewStore, um, you should ask Sam or Sage, not me. You're welcome. All right. Does that just about wrap up the question then? I should say I, I have more time if anyone wants to talk about anything else, but um, that's all I've got. Okay. I don't see any more questions coming in, so I think that's just about the end. Um, stay tuned for our next uh, Ceph Tech Talk, which will be on the, the 27th of August, so the, that fourth Thursday again. Um, Keep an eye on the Ceph Tech Talk page if that may change. But uh, other than that, thanks, John. This was great, and we'll see you guys next month. Thank you.